I'm honored to be able to introduce Roger Meyerson, the David L. Pearson Distinguished Service Professor of Global Conflict Studies. Professor Meyerson has made seminal contributions in the fields of economics and political science, and in 2007, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work in mechanism design theory. His scholarship has pioneered techniques to characterize the effects of communication among rational agents who have different information. He's also applied game theory tools to political science, analyzing how political incentives are affected by different electoral systems and constitutional structures. His recent work focuses on state building, conflict resolution, and architectures for democracy which promote accountability and peaceful societies. Please join me in welcoming Professor Meyerson. Hi. Well, after such an important morning, let me begin with a personal statement. I want, in March and April of 2003, uh, when the United States, I think wrongly, invaded Iraq, um, I was somewhat uselessly, but, but I, I felt a personal compulsion to go out on the streets in Chicago and I was protesting regularly every week against the, uh, the American invasion of Iraq that, uh, that year. Um, then in May of 2003, when the United States had taken control of Iraq and had taken supervision of its government with certain promises of, uh, of supporting the, deve the development of a, of a sovereign democratic state as fast as possible, uh, the absence of any understanding, any ex generally accepted understanding of how that mission was actually supposed to be accomplished, to me as a as a social scientist was unacceptable. And I've devoted my, much of my professional career since then to trying to understand what can a, be done by foreign forces, foreign well-intentioned hopefully force groups to support political development, um, understanding that Interventions are, I don't want an, any foreign groups well-intentioned to intervene to reconstruct the politics of Chicago and Illinois, thank you, and uh, it's, it's to be a last resort. But to me, that's the, a pressing question, as, and the social scientist has to work on, on the most important questions he can see, and it's a great privilege today to be able to do it as a part of the Pearson Institute and to talk about it today. From that perspective, the last resort, and, and, and the, oh, the, still, I, I believe that in the world today, global security requires some mechanism for fixing failed states when their violence and suffering threaten to spill over their borders into other nations. Uh, but I understand that after 18 years, for example, of, of costly state building efforts in Afghanistan, many have, observers have concluded that even a superpower with global military supremacy cannot uh, undertake missions to establish stable political orders in, uh, in foreign countries. That's a conclusion many have reached, that it's just impossible. Uh, but the necessity still seems to be there. As a social scientist, I'm forced to, to look in, into history and I see uh, that in the late 19th century, European imperialist colonizers used to make state building look easy. Uh, colonial agents in the late 19th century repeatedly demonstrated an ability to establish stable political orders in distant lands at negligible cost to the domestic taxpayers of their home countries. Uh, nobody wants to establish, to re, nobody wants to recreate the old colonial empires, the racist presumptions behind them are, are, are are, are, are unacceptable and the, the world is different. But I would suggest that nonetheless that 19th century colonial agents may have understood something about 
how to establish stable political order, something that's maybe been forgotten by, um, by state builders in the early 20th, 21st century. This morning, uh, Emma Sky observed that, uh, I think very, very rightly, very wisely, that, that in 2003, in the early year, first year, uh, year or so of, of, of the American occupation of Iraq under Paul Bremer, that the goals of the, in, the political goals of the intervention were, were fundamentally wrong, were wrong in, in, in many fundamental ways. I, let me just say what I think my thesis is going to be that the British colonial practice in the 19th century had a, was, had a systematic mechanism for guaranteeing that when it, they went to one country after another, they had a mechanism for guaranteeing that they found the right feasible political goals relative to their imperialist you know, ultimate objective, but they understood how to create, and they had a mechanism for f identifying politically feasible goals, and that's, that was the secret to their success, and that's what I'm gonna try to discuss today. Um, in 1922, Lord Frederick Lugard wrote a 600-page treatise on col colonial state building, as he had practiced it, in Malawi, Uganda, and the, the capstone of his career, Nigeria. Fortunately, on page 113 of that book, he tells us that the basic principles of this whole operation can be summarized in just three words, decentralization, continuity, and cooperation. So now you just need to understand what he meant by each. Decentralization referred to the uh, devolution of local authority to a team of district officers, one uh, who were these, and these district officers formed the essential backbone of the British colonial administration. Each district officer was responsible for overseeing the political development and then the economic development of a district which would be, was small enough that uh, the district officer could visit almost all of it, uh, talked with people in almost all of the district in a month or so each year of touring around on foot. Um, under Lugard's principle of decentralization, the district officer had full authority to represent with locally to represent the, the British Empire and to exercise all of its power within his district. So imperial authority was decentralized, but locally it was concentrated at the hands of one official for whom political development was the primary concern. For continuity, District officers were supervised by a provincial commissioner who was himself a senior experienced district officer and uh, whose, whose province typically included three or four districts. All the major decisions and actions of the district officer had to be recorded and reported to his supervising uh, provincial commissioner. You see, the district officers uh, were, rot were rotated regularly. Every couple of years they'd be transferred to a different district or uh, transferred for, to, uh, or, or rotated through an office in the central administrative secretariat of the, of the, of the, of the colony, in the capital of the colony. Um, so it was essential that, that the provincial commissioners who were supervising the district officers, the provincial commissioners were expected to have a long-term uh, relationship with just one province. They were to serve in supervising the district officers of one province over usually the, the balance of their career uh, so that they could maintain the essential continuity of commitment that was needed for uh, long-term political agreements that the district officers were negotiating. The principle of cooperation directed the district officers to build a broad, inclusive coalition for local governance by building trust and identifying common interests, building common interests with 
ideally local groups, the leaders of, of, of all local groups within the, uh, within the district, uh, lest they otherwise become spoilers. It was essential that indigenous local community leaders should feel that they have some, can get some benefits of power in the political system. Uh, in Lugard's scheme, the primary goal, the first goal of political development would be the establishment of a local leadership, a, a broad-based local leadership that had the ability to uh, collect taxes from their communities and manage budgets with uh, all local leaders, uh, all cooperating local leaders getting a share in the tax revenues. So the the team of district officers formed a network, a decentralized network that was sensitive, by design was sensitive and responsive to local political forces. If the, uh, if the colonial governor was not himself a career district officer, then the general practice was to have a lieutenant governor who was a career district officer. So that the policies of the entire colony in the, when the British were taking over one, one little spot of the world and then another spot of the world with seemingly easily, in each colony, the political goals and policies were being determined by the team of district officers uh, and therefore could rely on their detailed understanding of what indigenous local leaders wanted, were willing to do, and were capable of doing or incapable of doing. For a contrast with, in comparison with, with, with contemporary problems, it, let's consider Iraq. Uh, uh, the Kingdom of Iraq, which endured for 37 years, was established in 1921, yes, by a British state building mission. Uh, the, that state building mission was, uh, from, uh, was managed by a team of about 70 district officers spread around the provinces and districts of Iraq. Uh, and there were five, uh, according to Gertrude Bell, there were fi five uh, British officers in the central administration with Gertrude Bell, uh, whose report on this uh, uh, stands as a, uh, a document worth reading today. To me, I see this as a stark contrast with the central concentration of American administrative officials in Baghdad's green zone after the fall of Saddam Hussein in 2003. But I would say a key, a key lesson from this history of the uh, British colonial district officers is that when the goal of foreign assistance is political development, and let's say usually the goal of foreign assistance is economic development, but when the goal of foreign assistance is political development, then to accomplish political change, the ideal is that all assistance in any one locality should be under the direction of one district development officer whose duty is to monitor the local political situation and with the aid resources to encourage uh, political leaders, local political leaders, to cooperate with each other and with the national regime. I think to illustrate the contemporary practical applicability, potential applicability of the district officer model, let me talk briefly about the, uh, the, the, the situation in Syria. Well, I, we, we can only hope that uh, the latest round of fighting that, that's paused in the that's begun it but paused in the north that perhaps this will be the last round of fighting in this long, terrible civil war. Uh, the long struggle in Syria is apparently ending with a broad triumph for the Assad regime, and the Western powers uh, have clearly very little leverage with which to support or to to help improve the prospects for those people who, who worked for democracy in Syria uh, in, this, in this long struggle. But I would argue, I would suggest that the, that the district officer model still can, can suggest how to maximize the, the impact 
of such limited leverage as is still available. So imagine a broad international coalition of democratic nations jointly financing a generous fund for reconstruction in Syria after the end of the fighting. Under Lugard's principle of cooperation, we should understand that uh, uh, some fraction of the assistance is going, has, to be, has to go to the benefit of the, uh, of the Assad regime. So let me pause and say, I want the, coal, the district officer model would say that the international coalition of democratic nations putting together a generous fund for support of reconstruction in Iraq would give it under the condition, now forgive me, I forgot the most important thing, would give it under the condition that the all distribution of the aid must be supervised by district development officers, one for each of Syria's 65 districts. That's the point. Now, under the principle of cooperation, we need to understand that this money isn't going in unless the Assad regime accepts that, and that's going to mean that some fraction, some substantial fraction of it has to go to the benefit of people connected with the Assad regime. That means it's spent through contractors, who, and they get profits to contractors who are connected to the Assad regime, and the, much of the assistance is going to, some fraction of the assistance has to be dedicated as this to, to pr providing public goods that might benefit only the communities that uh, supported the Assad regime consistently during the Civil War. However, the coalition of donors should direct each of those district officers to insist that the remainder, some, I don't know, is that a, a half of the, of the funds, uh, maybe only a third of the funds, but some minimal fraction of the funds must be in every district dedicated to helping people in other communities who didn't necessarily support the Assad regime during the Civil War. And the money should be spent through contractors who have the confidence of people in those communities. Now, the key is that under this, to, to take from, from, from the, the district officer model, that if in any district, one district, the district officer reports that uh, to his provincial supervisor for continuity, when he reports that the Assad regime is not allowing him to spend even that minimal fraction for the benefit of the, all the people of, 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 of the district, including those who didn't support Assad in, in, the, uh, in the Civil War. Then, in the capitals of the donor nations, foreign ministers and heads of state are going to need to announce that, that all aid to, to, to Syria is going to be halted until this problem is, is solved and the, the, the district officer can, can, uh, can certify that at least this minimal fraction of the aid is actually going to benefit people, uh, all, all the people of, 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 of his district. The point is that the strategic management of the entire operation needs to be driven by these district officers, these local observers who are full-time in, in their district, who are monitoring, whose job is to monitor the local situation, assess what is realistically feasible, and then use their power that's delegated to them in the broader system to uh, achieve the maximal good that is feasible. Please, I have talked about colonialism today not to apologize for its evils, but to try to draw a lesson from what was, for worse or for better, and it was often for both, a very effective way of establishing political order in, in randomly designated countries around the world. It, and I think that lesson is that missions for political development need to be managed by a decentralized team to take their whole strategic direction from a decentralized team that should include local officials who can engage with and work with community leaders throughout the nation where, where the mission is, 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 is operating. You know, as we gather to celebrate the demolition of a wall here in Berlin, we should remember that the 
President of the United States wants to build a new wall from the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico in order to stop the, a stream of refugees who co are coming from a few small countries in Central America. A better alternative would seem to be to, for the United States to undertake a mission to support the development of effective, democratically accountable governance in those countries so that people can be protected in their homes and not have to flee as refugees to the north. In the world today, that obvious alternative has been essentially neglected by policymakers because the failures and frustrations of centralized state building efforts, yes, in Iraq and Afghanistan, have convinced people that even the world's richest and most powerful nation cannot do anything to support positive political development anywhere else. But I believe that the lessons of the British Empire can show us that a mission to support positive political development needs a form of decentralized political management, and that, I fear, has not been sufficiently tried for many years. Thank you. <laughs>